Thank you, Antone, for that beautiful prelude. Welcome to First United Methodist Church Richardson. My name is Josh Fitzpatrick. I'm one of the associate pastors on staff here, and it is my privilege today to fill in for Pastor Clayton Oliphant, who recently celebrated his 60th birthday. So if you haven't had an opportunity to send him an email or a note of celebration, I would encourage you to do so. Also at this time, I wanna invite you to register your attendance and make you aware that today is a communion Sunday. And so I wanna invite you to get a cup of either water or juice and get some bread or some crackers to prepare yourself to celebrate the sacrament together later on in today's service. I just wanna thank you again for joining us for worship today. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Would you join your voices with mine as we sing this opening hymn? Welcome to our prayer time this morning. As I always do, I encourage you to pull down our prayer list, which is online at www.fumcr.com slash pray. These are the persons who have asked us to pray for them, which I hope you'll do in your prayer time this coming week. And if you want to add your own name and prayer concerns and joys, feel free to do that as well. Our text today has the Apostle Paul in Athens, Greece, where he's standing before the people of Athens at the Europagus, and he tells them, I saw a statue to the unknown God. And that tells me you have a deep spiritual hunger. I don't think our hunger is any different today. And I hope that during our prayer time this morning, we can lift to God our hope that we can satisfy that spiritual hunger ourselves. Please join me in prayer. It's a brand new calendar year, oh God but the longing within us, the spiritual hunger that wells up inside is nothing new. We join the Athenians who knew that they were being called to something special, but couldn't quite identify that calling. Although we may be more confident in our own calling, we too stand ready to respond to that still powerful and yet sometimes imperceptible or even confusing voice. And even in our corporate prayer time this morning, oh God, we pause in silence to hear that voice again.
too often, O God, we try to ignore your calling. You may be calling us to something for which we're not ready yet. And yet, if we're not ready, we will often drown out your voice with our own busyness, our smugness, and our certainty. You are not unknown to us, but we need to learn that our relationship with you is always in progress. We pray this morning, Lord, that we will enter this new year with a greater intention of listening for your voice calling us, working to discern your message for us, and then having the courage to act upon it. We hear you, Lord. Your voice is not always clear, but that's on us. In this new year, May a new and better understanding of you emerge with each one of us every day. As we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. The mission and ministry of First United Methodist Church in Richardson depends on our gifts. I encourage you to give. You can do so by texting, by going online, or by sending in a check. Whatever you do is greatly appreciated. Happy New Year, everybody. Days may be darkest, but your light is greater. You light our way, God, you light our way. When evil is rising, you're rising higher with power to save, power to save. Because you are alive, Jesus, you are alive. Death had a stronghold, but your life was stronger. Rose from the grave, rose up from the grave. When evil is rising, you're rising higher with power to save, power to save. And you keep hope alive, you keep hope alive from the beginning to end. Your word never fails, you keep hope alive because you are alive. Jesus, you are alive. There's hope in the morning, hope in the evening, hope because you're living, hope because you're breathing. There's hope in the breaking, hope in the sorrow, hope for this moment, my hope. For tomorrow there's hope In the morning a hope In the evening a hope Because you're living a hope Because you're breathing there's hope In the breaking a hope In the sorrow hope For this moment my hope For tomorrow you keep hope alive Hope alive from the beginning to end. Your word never fails. You keep hope alive because you are alive. Jesus, you are alive. You keep hope alive. You keep hope alive from the beginning to end. Your word never fails. You keep hope alive because you are alive. Jesus, you are alive. 
Good morning. I'm Natalie Ninovich, Associate Children's Director, and welcome to Children's Time. Today, I would like to invite everyone to participate in Children's Time because we are all children of God. Raise your hand if you have ever had to move somewhere. Maybe you moved to a new home because mom and dad got a new job or your family outgrew your current home. Maybe you moved to a new school or a church, or maybe you changed to a new dance team or a new soccer team. I bet whatever your move was, it was a little bit hard because you were leaving something that was familiar to you. You were leaving people that you knew and that you loved far behind. Today, I want to look at some scripture from the Old Testament in the book of Genesis, where God asked Abraham to pick up his family and to move to a new country. Let's read what it says. He said, get out of your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You are blessed. And the Lord did this. He picked up his family and he moved to this new country. And then he built an altar just for God. There's one piece of um, scripture that I really want us to focus on for a minute. God says, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. What does it mean to be blessed? Well, blessings are things that we can be thankful for, like when God provides us with those beautiful sunrises or beautiful sunsets, the rivers and the lakes that we get to play in and fish in. He blesses us with our family and our friends that are there for us and that care for us. And then when we're a blessing, we can go and we can bless other people by caring for them and showing them that we love them and showing them God's love. So this week, I have something that I want everyone to do. I want you to find a piece of paper or something you can write or draw on. And I want you to make a sign that says, you are a blessing. And then hang this sign somewhere that you're going to see it every day. Maybe on your refrigerator or on your bathroom mirror. And remember that you are a blessing. And think of ways that you can go and you can bless other people. Now, we, I want to do one thing that we do in Sunday school before we leave. And I want you to take a moment and bless each member of your family. We're going to do this by taking some blessing balm, if you have any, or your finger. And you're going to make a cross on each person's forehead. And you're going to say, as you look into their eyes, you are a blessing. You can also do it on the palm of their hand. So let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for the gifts that you give us and all of the blessings. Help us to be a blessing to others around us and help to remind us that we are a blessing every day. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You are a blessing. Have a great week. The scripture reading is from Acts 17, verses 22 through 27. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What, therefore, you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Paviel, for reading our scripture today. So I haven't always been a Texan, and some of you have heard me tell stories about the transition from my life of being born and raised in California to becoming a Texan. It's hard to believe that Megan and I moved here almost 10 and a half years ago now, but, but there were definitely learning curves. And 
I've talked about some of the changes in attire and having to figure out the greatness that is high school football here in Texas. Uh, I've also had to learn about the greatness that is the high school marching band here. And granted, I'm talking about high school because when I first moved to Texas, I was a youth director for four years. And so this was part of my learning. There is not much greater than a high school marching band in Texas. Uh, to that end, I also learned about this phenomenon in Texas called mums. That, the high school homecoming mums was definitely not a thing in California. <laughs> and you've also heard me talk a little bit about the differences in vocabulary. There are certain words here in Texas that are different than they were in California. And one of those ones that I learned really early was different was the word barbecue. You see, in California, if I was having people over for a barbecue, that meant I was getting out this thing we call a grill and I, I would put hot dogs and hamburgers on the grill and we might have a, a side of, of avocado or guacamole because we like to put that on, on everything. But, but barbecuing was, was really just grilling hot dogs and hamburgers. And so when I was a youth director and I, I came here to Texas, I invited all of the, teen, the teens over for some barbecue after one of the football games. And so there I had the grill out and I had hamburgers and hot dogs and everybody came on over after the game and they said, I thought we were having barbecue. And I said, well, that's what I'm doing. And they laughed at me because they said, no, 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 Josh, that's not barbecue. That's, that's called grilling. <laughs> and of course it was grilling. It didn't have a G on the end because we do that in Texas as well. And, and so that was the first time that I, I recognized that the word I had been using my entire life, barbecue, to talk about grilling hot dogs and hamburgers, was not the same thing as the rest of the world used when they said the word barbecue, particularly here in Texas. It was also about that time that I was introduced to this heavenly meat they call brisket. Now, talk about a, a gift from heaven. I, I know this might seem over the top, but once you have brisket, your life is quite frankly changed forever. And that is the truth. I did not know what I was talking about when I was talking about barbecue. And yet in that moment, in those first few weeks of my residency in Texas, I learned that there was a difference in vocabulary and my eyes were opened to the world that is Texas barbecue. Now, we're doing a sermon series called, Is God Real? And I'm half tempted to just stop right there and say, have you tried Texas barbecue? <laughs> like, no further questions, case closed, God is real. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. So here in our text, Acts chapter 17, one of my favorite passages in scripture. We have the story of Paul in the city of Athens. Now Paul has this mission to tell the world about Jesus Christ and he shows up in Athens and it tells us earlier on that there are two groups of philosophers present. There are the Epicureans and there are, there are the Stoics. Now the Epicureans were these philosophers. Now both of them like to just sit around all day and talk about all the great things of, of divinity and it says they loved new ideas. The Epicureans were those who in their search for the divine believed that God was distant, way far off. And so the goal in life as an Epicurean was simply to just get by without upsetting the gods. Okay, so now that you have the, the, the Stoics, and the Stoics believed in this sense of, of inner divinity, like each one of us has divinity within us, and so the goal in life was to pursue virtue, which really was just getting in touch with your inner sense of divinity. You have these two extremes, the far off and the, the very innate, and yet both of these groups of philosophers were on spiritual journeys to discover the divine. And so I love what happens here when Paul shows up in Athens. He has this choice to make. Was he going to, to come at them with his own language, telling them about Jesus, or is he going to speak the language of his audience? And that is what he ultimately chooses. It tells us that there he was at the Areopagus. This is the, the high court of Athens. It overlooks the entire city, including all of these temples that were down below. And he tells the philosophers in front of him that he saw the altar with the inscription to an unknown God. And then he proceeds to tell them that that God that was formerly unknown is now knowable. And he doesn't live in these little temples made by human hands because God is the source of all life. 
And then I love what he does in verse 28. We didn't read this verse, but I would encourage you to go back and read the entire chapter, chapter 17. In verse 28, Paul says, For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. So both of these lines, in him we live and move and have our being, and for we too are his offspring, are both lines from Greek poetry. And so as the philosophers are there saying, like, who is this guy? They all of a sudden hear these lines from their own poets. It gives him what we might call social capital. Like all of a sudden their ears are open and they say, okay, hmm, maybe this Paul guy knows what he's talking about. And so as he honors their own intellect and as he speaks their own language, he then continues to tell them about this one true God, this formerly unknown God who is now knowable in and through Jesus Christ. And it says that some believed that day, right then and there, in the good news that Paul was telling them. I mean, what a fantastic example about how to tell people about Jesus. Notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't come with a bullhorn and and just start yelling at them about who Jesus is and how they need to change their life immediately. No. He respects who they are. He respects them as individuals, as fellow human beings on a search, on a spiritual journey. He recognizes how far they've each come on their own journey and says, yes, I know that you have an unknown God. Let me tell you the rest of the story. And he proceeds to tell them the rest of the story that is the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's kind of like when I was told about barbecue. I, I, I thought I knew what I was doing. I thought I knew what barbecue was. I thought that grilling hot dogs and hamburgers was, was barbecue until I moved to Texas and finally somebody told me the rest of the story. I, I mean, what better way to tell people about Jesus than taking our cues from what Paul does here in the city of Athens? And quite frankly, that's the first point I want to make today is that we need to do a better job of telling people about Jesus. We often take two extremes. So there's a group of people on this one extreme who just want to tell you what everything is that's wrong with your life. That you are a sinner going to hell in a handbasket. I don't exactly even know what that phrase means, but, but I get the point of the, the extremity of this and the, the aggression in telling you why you're wrong and why I'm right and, and why what I know you need to know and why what I believe you need to believe. And the truth is, when we approach evangelism like this, when we tell people the good news in such an aggressive manner, it falls on deaf ears because nobody wants to hear about anything from someone who is high and holy and judgmental. And yet we can also swing the opposite direction to the opposite extreme where we're so afraid of offending anybody that we cease telling anybody about Jesus in the first place. Now, there are very well-intentioned people who believe that we should not even be sending missionaries around the world because we don't have the right anymore to, or never did have the right to, to commit the sins of our past of these different forms of colonialism as we are going to different nations and, and bringing what we think is going to help other people. And yes, there is legitimacy to these concerns and there are ways that we can do things creatively and do it well, but we cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because quite frankly, if we are not telling the world about Jesus, then there are literally people in this world who will never hear the gospel. There has to be a middle ground. And this is where we take our cues from Paul. There has to be an approach to telling people about Jesus where we don't forget the mission that Jesus has given us to spread the good news, and yet we do it in such a way that respects the audience in front of us that respects the fact that each one of us is on a spiritual journey and we are each at a different point, that respects the humanity of the people to whom we are sent so that they will have ears to listen and hearts to receive the gospel. We're all on a spiritual journey. And I know it doesn't seem fair because some of us have been blessed with lives where we are surrounded by people who embody the love of God. And it's easy for these people to believe in a God who knows them and loves them. And others of us have had upbringings where we were surrounded by evil, by evil on a daily basis. And it's really difficult to believe in a God 
who loves them and who knows them. And some of us were blessed with mentors who have walked with us on our spiritual journey. And, and others of us just feel like we're trying to figure it out on our own. And there's so much iniquity in, in how we've come to know who God is and in the different places we are on, on this spiritual journey that we need to recognize the fact that our own experiences significantly shape our journey. My, one of my favorite theologians, N.T. Wright, has this book called Simply Christian. And it's the book that we're loosely basing this sermon series on. Simply Christian, it lays out the foundations of the Christian faith. And in the first four chapters of that book, he talks about what he calls echoes of God's voice in the world. And the recognition that each one of us innately has this desire to search after something that is greater than ourselves. This inner spirituality, that is one of the echoes of God's voice in this world. I, I love one of the stories that he tells. He talks about how he sits down with people on occasion. And these people who have, have, have given up believing in God, if they ever believed in God in the first place, and he'll sit down with them and he'll say, tell me about the God that you don't believe in. And sometimes they'll say things like, well, I, I don't believe in a God who is a, a dictator of the world and who condemns people to hell and a, a, a God who is just full of wrath. Or they'll say something like, well, I don't believe in a God who just doesn't care about us at all, who just, who created the world and just lets it play out. A, a distant God as maybe the Epicureans historically believed. And, and at that, that moment, he'll take the opportunity to look at that person and say, you know what? I don't believe in that type of God either. And then he'll proceed to tell them what is perhaps a more accurate portrayal of who God is in this world as he, he has the opportunity to tell them the rest of the story as he sees it. We are all in different places on our spiritual journeys and yet it is impossible to deny the fact that we are all searching for something. That across history, across borders, across the globe for generations and generations back to the creation of the world humanity has been searching for something greater than itself we are all on a spiritual journey and yet each our each of our journeys is uniquely shaped by our own life experiences this inner search for something that is greater than us is one of these echoes of God's voice in the world. Now, does that prove God's existence? No, but it certainly starts the conversation. Now, as we look forward to this new year, 2021, as we reflect back on the year behind us, 2020, now is as good a time as any to truly do some self-reflection and ask yourself, do I believe in God? Do I, do I really really believe in God? Have I allowed Jesus Christ and the gospel of Christ to change my life? Am I humble enough to admit that, that maybe my idea of who God is in the world might not be as accurate as it should be? Am I also vulnerable enough to admit that I am still on the middle or in the midst of my own spiritual journey? And if you do know Jesus, then the second question is, are you telling others? Uh, and are you doing it? How are you doing? Are you doing it aggressively or are you just shying away from it altogether because you don't want to offend others? The sad truth is, if no one had told me about brisket, <laughs> I would still be grilling hot dogs and hamburgers and calling it barbecue. <laughs> okay, okay, more seriously though, the other truth is that if we aren't intentionally telling the world about the gospel of Jesus Christ, then who knows how long some people will go on living without knowing the joy of the Lord in their own life. It is my prayer this year that as we admit to ourselves the reality of God in our own lives, we would have not only the courage to say that God is real, but the courage to tell others in a way that is respecting of who they are and where they are on their own spiritual journeys. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. God, we thank you for this challenge today. 
We thank you for the inspiration through the Apostle Paul as he told the philosophers in Athens about the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. May we too have the courage to tell our world about your love and to do it in such a way that we portray you accurately. God, will you be with us in this new year? Would you become real to us in new ways that we might be newly motivated to be your hands and feet in this world? Amen. Amen. As we transition into a time of communion, I want to remind you to have your bread and cracker and your juice and water nearby. I also want to mention that in the United Methodist Church, we practice an open table, which means all are welcome and invited to participate in the sacrament. Please join your voices with mine in the prayer of confession. We seek to live as true disciples of Jesus Christ, but sometimes we fall short. Let us now examine ourselves before God, humbly confessing our sins. God of all mercies, you are faithful to cleanse us from our sins and restore us to Christ's image. Praise and glory be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. On the night that our Savior was betrayed, he sat with his disciples. He gave thanks to you, O God, as he broke the bread. He passed it around and said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup. And he passed it around and said, Take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you do so, do so in remembrance of me. And so God, as we are gathered here today, wherever we are gathered and whenever we are gathered, remind us of our unity in you, our unity as the body of Christ. May your spirit descend on these elements as they empower us for your service. May they unite us as your living sacrifice in this world to love our neighbors as we love you. God, we pray these things in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, would you take the elements? This is the body of Christ, broken for you. This is the blood of Christ, poured out for the forgiveness of your sins.
beloved children of God who receive from the table of grace. Let us renew our covenant with God as we enter into a new year of service and ministry as the body of Christ. I invite you to lift your hands and open your hearts as you recite the Wesley Covenant prayer with me. I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt, rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Thank you again for joining us for worship today. I want to make an invitation at this time for you to join our church family here in an official capacity. If you haven't yet become a member of First United Methodist Church Richardson, if you would send us an email to join at fumcr.com, we would be more than happy to welcome you into the family. I want to make you aware of an opportunity that we have in the coming weeks to participate in a Bible study that's going to be led by Dr. Dan Flanagan, one of our pastors on staff here. It is going to correspond with the sermons that you'll hear each week during this Is God Real sermon series. You can find out more information about that online Bible study on our website, fumcr.com learn. I also want to reiterate something that you heard earlier in the service from one of our children's directors, Natalie Nenovich, who talked uh, to our kids about making visible those words, that phrase, you are a blessing. Now, I just want to encourage you and tell you that that's not just for kids. I think this new year is a perfect opportunity for each one of us to find a place in our own home, whether that's on our, our bathroom mirror or on a three by five card or somewhere in our car, somewhere where we will see that on a daily basis, you are a blessing, to be reminded that we are a blessing, that God has blessed us to be a blessing to others. That said, would you receive this benediction? May the God who created you and knows you better than you know yourself, remind you of your sacred worth as a child of God. May God give you courage to tell others about the love of Jesus Christ. And may the Holy Spirit empower you to do so with respect for where each person is on their own spiritual journey. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and have a great, great week. Thank you.